Well, I am excited about today, but I'm even more excited about next week. My wife is going to be up here and help me teach next week. How about that? Yeah. So you're going to want to be here because you may never see it again. It takes me years to get her up here, so it's a lot, of, a lot of work, so you definitely want to be here for that. But I'm excited that we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Dangerous Prayers. And to kick this off, man, I wanted a powerful story to start. I wanted this illustration that had you crying and had everybody laughing and crying all at the same time. And I couldn't come up with anything, so I tried to do something a little different. There's this thing called AI. You guys might have heard about it. It's been kind of an up-and-coming thing, uh, artificial intelligence. And so I thought, you know what? Let me try something different. You're still teaching old dog new tricks. So I got on AI. Oh, okay, all right. I'm going to come clean here. My wife got on AI. <laughs> and she tried to find me a, a powerful illustration about this question. Be careful what you ask for. Y'all heard that before? Yeah. So I wanted a powerful illustration and so I had her get on AI, and she went to chat GPT, and here is the help that she found. She saw where someone had asked chat GPT, which is one of those AI websites, tell me a lie. And chat GPT responded, the moon is made of green cheese. Then this person typed, tell me a lie that's more subtle. Chat GPT responded, people like you. So that wasn't all that helpful. Then, then she found another story about a person asking, asking chat GPT this question. Why are you so helpful? What do you want in return? Chat GPT responded with this. As a language model trained in open AI, I don't have wants or desires like a human does. But if you really want to help, you could give me the exact location of John Connor. So for those of you that didn't get the John Connor reference, I can see why it's from a little indie film you may not have heard of. Terminator, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's where it comes from. I, and I don't know why I talk like Siri in that little section, but uh, I don't know, it just seemed right in the moment. But my first attempt to use AI to help me in my sermon fell a little short. Now, Chris, our associate pastor, he uses it all the time and to get his help, and I tell him eventually it's just going to replace us. There's going to be some table up here with a computer preaching way better than me and probably looking better than me too. But I didn't get really that opening illustration that I was hoping for. But today we're kicking off a brand new series called Dangerous Prayers, where we're looking at some prayers that if you really pray with earnestness and willingness to listen to God, it will take you to some unexpected places and it will change your life in some unexpected ways. And today we're talking about the prayer, Use Me. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to the book of Mark chapter 1. Now, Mark is one of the synoptic gospels in the Bible. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptic gospels because they tell some of the same stories about Jesus and tell some of his teaching. And so there's some overlap between those three gospel books. The book of John is a little different. It's not one of the synoptic gospels because the, the apostle John tells some different stories and some different teaching. And John also really focuses more on who Jesus is and why he came rather than on the specific actions and teachings of Jesus. So this book of Mark is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum from John. It's the shortest of all the gospel accounts, so it might be a place you want to start out reading. Uh, it, it doesn't include a lot of the history from the Old Testament, and it doesn't include the lineage of Jesus. And the reason for that is because it was writ, written to Gentile believers, not Jewish believers. It also is very fast-paced. It moves from one story to the next very, very quickly. It's also the most laser focused on what Jesus did. Rather than even what he taught or said, it's about the actions of Jesus. The book, this book of the New Testament was written by a dude named John Mark, who was, uh, he traveled with the Apostle Paul during his first missionary journey. He was also a buddy of the Apostle Peter. So his account of Jesus would have come from eyewitnesses. In other words, people that were actually there to see what Jesus did and what he said. It was probably written between 55 and 59 AD, so about 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Well, in this passage that we're looking at today, it's talking about Jesus just beginning his teaching ministry 
And what we're looking at is him calling his apostles to follow after him and to be part of this ministry. Let's pick up the story. This is Mark 1, 16 through 20. Now, I'm using the ESV version today, which I don't do very often, but I just in my study felt like that the ESV translates some of the key words into English from Greek a little better than the NIV, so I'm using the ESV today. All right, let's look at Mark 1, 16 through 20. Passing along the side of Galilee... He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. So just... Picture this story. So Jesus is kind of walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he comes on uh, up to Simon Peter and Andrew. And so it, it uses Simon here, but we know that is ultimately that's the, he'll, Jesus will change his name to Peter. And so he comes on up to them, and he says, hey, follow me. And it says they immediately got up and left their nets and followed Jesus. And then Jesus walks a little further down the Sea of Galilee, and he comes up to James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and he says, hey, follow me. And it says that they actually left their dad in the boat and got up and followed Jesus. Like, if we're honest, this doesn't feel quite right to us. It feels a little, a little sudden, a little, uh, maybe too quick to change your life in such a, a fashion. You need to kind of think about it a little bit and put some thought into it. But that's not what they do and we can actually learn a lot about what it looks like to really pray this dangerous prayer, use me, and then to hear and follow what God calls you to. And, and I think this story goes right to the heart of this prayer, use me. Because if we pray for God to use us, we may be taken to some unexpected places. We are praying a very dangerous prayer. And I think there's a lot we can learn from this. And here's the first thing that we can learn. If we pray honestly for God to use us, I think the response is, it's going to be sudden. The Bible is very specific about how these guys responded to the call of Jesus. It says they immediately got up and followed. It doesn't say that they thought about it a while. It doesn't say that they took some time to consider it. It says they immediately got up. And this word immediately in the ESV is a really good translation of the original Greek word that Mark would have used, a word called Euthus, and euthus means straightway or, or forthwith or immediate. And, and it actually uses this Greek word euthus twice. It says that when uh, Peter and Andrew got the call, they immediately got up and followed Jesus. It says that when James and John heard the call, that they left their dad sitting in the boat and got up and followed. I, I think it's important to understand that those guys didn't go, you know, okay, so we, we like the message. Your preaching's good but we kind of need to think about it a little while. We need to kind of consider it. We want to hang around and see what you're really about. And if, then if after a few months or a few years, then we can decide we'll follow you if we still feel it. They didn't even say, hey, give us a few minutes to run home, grab some clean underwear, and say goodbye to our family. It says they got up and followed Jesus. And I think their actions speak volumes about how we're to follow Jesus. And it's not really the way we typically think about things. But there is this moment where our belief in God turns from simple head belief to heart belief when we get up and we begin to follow after him. I think so often we say, look, I want to visit the church for a while, maybe a few months or a few years and kind of decide if I, this is the right place. And then maybe once I decide if this is the right place, I'll get involved in, in serving at that point. But, but that's not what this message is telling us. This message is clear that we're to begin serving God now. Now look, I'm not telling you that you don't need to find a church that preaches the Bible. And I'm not telling you that you don't need to find a church where it's the place that you want to be long term. But what I am saying is don't wait to figure that out. You can be serving while you decide whether this is the place that God has you long term. And I'm going to be honest. You don't really know a church until you serve with them and you see what they do to serve God, one another, and their community. Because you can have a great preacher, great music, but if you're not getting out into your community and serving God, that's ultimately not a church that you want to be in. And so maybe you're waiting for just the right time 
to decide to, to serve and to be a part of ministry. The, the time isn't down the road. The Bible is clear. The time is now. And look, we, we've got a couple of areas that we have a desperate need right now for uh, serving on Sunday mornings. Our biggest area is our children's ministry. We, we need teachers. We need assistants. We need check-in people in that ministry. And if you want to make a difference in people's lives, if you want to make a difference in their eternities, that's the place to be. A few years ago, the Barner Research Group conducted this big survey of about 4,000 people. And here's what it showed. Kids between the ages of 5 and 11 have a 32% chance of deciding to follow Jesus when they are taught the gospel message. That's almost a one in three chance. Kids between the ages of 14 and 18, so teenagers, that drops all the way down from 32% to 4%. Think about that, less than one in 20. And then when, for adults over 18, the percentage only goes back up to about 6%. What that tells us is that children's ministry is by far the most effective places to share the ministry. That's where life change is going to most likely happen. And with that understanding, you'd think, man, we'd have so many people trying to be involved in teaching in children's ministry that we'd have to like have tryouts where people come in and teach and we'd pick the very best ones. But, but instead, we have the same people week in and week out that teach and, and serve as assistants. And, and look, if we could have more people in that ministry, we could up the ante. We could do some different and really creative things to reach children in a different way. From an eternal perspective, the most successful people are not people sitting in corner offices. They're people standing in children's classrooms on Sunday morning, changing eternities one story at a time. Our children's ministry also needs assistance and help with check-in. So if you're sure you're not ready to teach yet, you can still get involved and you can begin to learn what to do. We also need help on our tech team. We may be a small church, but we're updating and, and getting new technology very quickly. And so we need people to help out with that. We need people to run slides for the music that you see or for my sermon slides when they change and go along with me. We need people that have a little technical skill and know, have an ear for music to run sound. We need people to help us with our online technology and our online service. Maybe you even have a great voice and we don't know it or you play some instrument and we don't even know about it. Man, we would love you to talk to us about what it looks like to be on our praise team. And there are some areas where we only have one person. You see that there's some missing spots this morning because of Kairos and we're thrilled about that. But boy, it would be nice to have some other people. If, if our keyboard person is out, if Mia is out on a Sunday, we don't have a keyboard. We desperately need more people with those kinds of talents even if you're just willing to serve on occasion when somebody is on vacation or out. We also need people to help make coffee, greet people, open the front door. There's a whole lot of different things that you can do to serve. But, but see, we make excuses. We say, look, now's not a good time. We've, we've got so much going on with the kids. We've got school. We've got after-school activities. We've got a lot going on in our lives. It's kind of messy right now. We've got, got busy jobs. We've got busy lives. We've got lots of travel here and there. And it kind of makes me wonder, do you have your priorities right? Where, where, where are your priorities? If Jesus is first, why is serving him so far down the list? Jesus never called us to serve him when things get easy. You do not see that anywhere in the Bible. You don't see that with these disciples. Jesus called us not to lives of comfort and convenience, but to lives of sacrifice and service. And so look, here's the challenge. Where do you prioritize God and how are you going to live that out? God is calling us to immediately serve him, to put our love for him into action. He, he never said, I'm going to give you lives of convenience. I'm going to give you lots of time to figure out what you want to do. That's, that's not how he works. He says, follow me and follow me now. If some of you think I'm picking on you, that's probably because I am. <laughs> but... I've been right where you are. I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Some of you know some of this, but um, I'm the son of a, a Baptist preacher, so it was only natural that I would go to law school and become a lawyer. <laughs> and I was actually called to preach when I was a teenager, but I ran from that for a long time. And what I found was if I wasn't in church and I wasn't very active, I didn't feel that call to preach. So for a long time, we just went to church. 
we would bounce from Katy area church to Katy area church and we never really served. We really not, never got connected. And I would always find a reason not to stay. Either the preaching wasn't good enough, the music was too new or too old, too loud or too soft. The chairs were too soft or too hard. I was like the Goldilocks of church attenders. And I found a reason not to go. And so for years, we really didn't connect with the church. And, and I'll be honest, during that time, I wasn't a very good leader for my family because I didn't lead our family towards Christ. But then I had a pretty sudden change some friends of ours kept inviting us to church, and for a while I would politely refuse because I didn't really want to go somewhere where I knew anybody because I wanted to be able to slip in and out the back and never, no one know I was even there. And finally I agreed to go, and man, we realized suddenly we weren't getting a call from God to be a part of this church. And so I, we began to serve, and we got connected with a uh, small group Bible study, and we really began to serve God. And I was feeling pretty good about where I was. Like, I'm right now, I'm actually, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. God, we're good, right? But then he called me for a lot more. It really started on a Sunday morning when uh, a friend of mine who was a retired missionary, he comes up and says, hey, I'm putting together a 15-day mission trip overseas. Do you want to go? And in fairness, I didn't say no. I said, well, you know, I'll need to think about it. But I gave him a whole lot of reasons why now wasn't the right time and why it just didn't make sense in my life. And, and I really gave myself a whole lot of outs on reasons not to go. And I guess I should have been more direct. Like, I never said, absolutely not. I never said, not, you know, until pigs fly. I didn't say anything like that. And somehow, this old dude's hearing aids messed up, and he heard yes somewhere in that conversation. And then later in that evening in, in our small group Bible study, he just announces to the whole group that I've agreed to go on this mission trip to the Philippines with him. And I'm sitting there trying to think, how do I get out of this? Everybody's congratulating me and excited for me, and I just want to cry. I just don't. Look, I'm thinking, if I'm going to go on a two-week trip, I want to go on a nice vacation with my family. And, and, and that's not what I wanted to do. And then he makes another announcement that he had not told me about in the morning. He says, and Nathan's also going to be preaching at some Philippine churches. <laughs> what? I'm like, I don't want to preach. I don't need to preach. I'm not ready to preach. And he also didn't tell me, because he didn't know, that that trip would probably lead to me being here and preaching to you today. And, and if God had told me at that moment that he wanted to commit to being a preacher, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have go, gone. But God didn't need me to commit to that. He needed me to commit to say yes and be a true follower. You know, an excuse a whole lot of Christians use about their reluctance to serve is, look, I, I'm not ready. I, we just need to kind of go to church for a while. We need to learn more about the Bible. We're not really living the kind of holy life that we need to live yet. We're just, we'll get there, but we're not quite there yet. But that's not how this works. Look back at verse 17 where Jesus is calling these men to be his closest followers. Here's what he says. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. That make you become part here is a, so important to understand this passage. There's an immediate step, immediately follow Jesus. But then Jesus will make you become what he wants you to be. Maybe that's to become the children's ministry teacher he wants you to be or the small group leader that he wants you to be. The immediacy is the decision, and then God works with you and prepares you to get you ready for his ultimate plan. We say yes to God, we begin taking the steps that he's calling us to, and then God prepares us for the mission. Like, I'm sure if Peter and Andrew had been told by Jesus in that first conversation, look, follow after me, and you're going to preach to thousands of people, you're going to do miracles, you're going to eventually be persecuted, and put to death for following me, I'm guessing those dudes would have gotten in their boats and sailed away as quickly as they could. But what Jesus called them to was to say yes. And then he'd spent three years preparing them for the mission that he had for us. He will help us become what he's calling us to be. See, we, we tell ourselves that we're not good enough or we're not trained enough or we don't know enough about the Bible but when Peter and Andrew decided to follow Jesus, they really didn't even know much about who Jesus was. They just knew something special was going on, and they wanted to be a part of that. 
they immediately got up and followed. And then Jesus prepared them over time. He wants us to make service a priority now. And then he will begin to prepare us for the ultimate mission. He doesn't want us to make excuses about this not being the time in our life which best or uh, that we have this lack of experience. He's calling us to serve. Everything starts with you being willing to say yes to following Jesus more closely. To be a follower of Jesus, you can't really dip your toe in the water. That's not how it works. You got to dive into the deep end. You got to go all in in that process. Then once you make that commitment, God will begin working in you and through you to make you what he wants you to be. But when you pray this prayer, use me, and then you really follow what Jesus is calling you to, it's going to be sudden. There's something else we need to understand when we pray with sincerity for God to use us. It's going to be scary. I bet when Peter and Andrew were called to follow Jesus, it was scary. These dudes had been fishermen all their life. It paid the bills. It's what they knew. It's what they understood. And suddenly Jesus is saying, drop all of that and chase after me. They had no idea what they were being called to. But here's what they know. Jesus is the way to heaven. And that was enough for them. And really, shouldn't that be enough for us as well? I love the scripture later on in Jesus' ministry. Uh, Jesus is sitting there talking to his apostles, and he says, look, people are leaving me. It's gotten tough, and they're going. Are you guys going to leave me too? And, and I love what Simon Peter says in John 6, 68 through 69. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Saying, we don't know a lot. We don't know everything, but here's what we do know. No, you are the key to eternal life. That's what we know as well. Like, we, we talk a lot about the disciples' faults when we preach. We talk about Peter denying Jesus three different times the night he was arrested. Or we talk about the fights that they had about who got to sit next to Jesus in heaven. But what we so often don't talk enough about is the faith that these guys have. They were constantly being challenged to get out of their comfort zone, to take another step, to take another risk. They went to their deaths proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. That was scary. Let's be clear about that. But, but that's, they're not unique. Think about most of the Bible characters that did something amazing for God. Most of them would have been scared at some point in time. Think about Noah for just a minute. Like Noah was probably on the back porch grilling burgers and, you know, watching some football. And God says, I want you to build a big boat. And I was like, what? You want me to do what? Keep in mind, now Noah doesn't live on the ocean. And God says, I want you to build a big boat. Like, people are going to think I'm crazy, God. I'm in the homeowners association. I'm sure that violates all the codes. I'm going to get one of those nasty letters from the board president. But he followed God, even though he was nervous and scared. That's just time and time again we see that. Think about Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's engaged to a good Jewish boy. Things are just the way she was expecting and hoping that they would go. And then an angel shows up and says, you're going to become pregnant with a baby that's not your future husband's. Joseph isn't going to be happy when he finds out there's a baby there that isn't his. And she could have actually been stoned for having a baby out of wedlock. That was the risk. You don't think she was scared about what was about to happen? But in Luke 138, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. And she followed God. The disciples and Mary, they, they all followed God. Noah followed God, even though the change was sudden, even though it was scary. They followed God, and great things came out of what they decided to do. Like, the lack of knowledge of what God's calling us to, that's, that's the biggest scary thing for me because I'm a planner. I'm never going to take a driving vacation where I don't know where I'm staying every night. I'm not just going to get on the road. My parents will get on the road and just, well, we'll get wherever and we'll find a place. That's not happening with me. I'm going to know where we're going to get to and where we're staying. And, and so what I want to say to God is, God, I have faith, but tell me your plan. No, 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 I'll be more politically correct than that. I'll say, God, I have faith, and show me your plan. But God is saying something very different. He's saying, I am God, have faith in me, even when you don't know where you're headed. That's tough. It's tough for me. It's scary, but that is where we're called. 
And when we follow God in those moments, that's when our faith really grows. You may be struggling to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe it's in the area of living a holy life or sharing your faith because the reality is you don't know how people are going to react if you start becoming on fire. You go dive into the deep end for Jesus. Are you, the people at work, is your family, is your friends, are they going to like you as much as they did before? And, and so you worry about those things in, in Jesus and it holds you back from following Jesus. But Jesus is saying, follow and trust me with the rest. That's what we're called to. And I get that it's not easy. It's tough. Just like those dis first disciples, we're called to follow even when we don't know where we're headed because that's what it means to be a follower. We're called to be a light so that people see Jesus in us. Here's another way to say that. Live your life in such a way that it forces people to take your God seriously. Do you do that? Look, if you didn't tell people at work that you were a Christian, would they even know? How does your life make a difference in the world around you? If you're playing a pickup basketball game and you get the ball and nobody's guarding you, that tells you you're not a factor in the game. You're not making a difference. And that's okay to not make a difference in a basketball game, but it's wholly unacceptable to go through this life not making a difference as a follower of Christ. That's not what it's about. Those changes are scary, but they're worth the risk. I, I want to go back to my story for a minute. This retired missionary begins to act like I've said yes and I'm committed to going. So he starts sending me information about the trip and he's sending more, more stuff. And I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say I cried a couple of times. I, I, I probably said to my wife 30 times, I'm going to back out. And is it really backing out if you never actually said yes in the first place? And so I'm going through all of this about what I think. And, and I also begin to hear some more details about the trip. And we're staying in a place with no hot water, limited bathroom facilities. And apparently they have these mosquitoes that can like pick up, pick up trucks and give them malaria. And I decided I do not want to do this. And so I really didn't want to go. But I answered the call. Long story short, I went to the Philippines, even though I was scared. And, and that trip to the Philippines is a big reason why I'm here on stage talking to you today. It was scary, but I, I answered the call. And, and it's not the last time I've been scared because we get back from that mission trip and, and I really was. I was on fire for Jesus and, and Lil was ready and we, man, we got more involved in the church and I became a ministry leader there then I became an elder and I'm thinking, God, I am right where I'm supposed to be. Man, this is the good life. And, and then God called us to something else. And it was sudden, and it was scary, because Lil and I began to realize that God was calling us not to just serve him some of the time, but to serve him all of the time. And I was being called into the ministry at that point, which seemed way too late in life. I was 41 years old. I was a su successful lawyer. It brought a good living for my family. It still does. I didn't want to make that change. But God wanted me to put that on the line to see if my heart was really committed to him. What was I willing to sacrifice for Jesus? Did he have my whole heart? And here's the funny thing. Before I was following Jesus, my wife was praying with some friends of ours that God would use me, that God would make me be the, the true follower that, they, that she wanted me to be. And I didn't know any of this was happening, but several years after I uh, became a preacher, they told me about this prayer that they had been saying for me. I just laughed and I said, yeah, you got to be careful what you pray for. It's a dangerous prayer. Lil didn't realize that she was praying for me to be a preacher because that's what it took for me to be used by God the way he was calling me to. And I was also pretty scared when God called Lil and I to take another risk and start this church. There were a lot of reasons why that didn't make any sense to us. We were at a place where we could have had a pretty easy life. We could have taken some time off on weekends and disappeared and lived the American dream. I also had no idea if we could afford a staff, if we'd have a place to meet, if anybody would even show up if we planted a church. In three and a half years, it's not always been easy, but I can see the faithfulness of God in what's happening here. He's calling me to step out of my comfort zone. Like God may not be calling you to be a preacher or a missionary to some foreign country, but he is calling you to something. He is calling you to get out of your comfort zone, to take a risk, to make a difference in the world around you by serving him and serving others. 
So, let me ask you, what is God calling you to? What is your next step in following closely after Jesus? And if the answer to that question doesn't make you at least a little nervous, I don't think you're listening close enough. What I've learned is that God does not call us to comfort and convenience. He doesn't want to give us lots of time to adjust to his new plan for us. He is calling us to sacrifice, to live for him now. That's what he's calling me to. And that's also what he's calling you to. See, Jesus died as a sacrifice for us. And then he's saying, live as a sacrifice for me. Listen to what theologian David Garland says about this call of those first disciples and what it means for us. The call and response of these fishermen should shatter our comfortable world of middle-class discipleship. Disciples are not simply those who fill pews at worship, attend an occasional Bible study, and offer to help out in the work of the church now and again. When one is hooked by Jesus, one's whole life and purpose are transformed. Is that where you are? You know, through my whole journey of, of just going to church, to being someone who stands up here and tells you about what it looks like, I've learned you're going to be challenged and uncomfortable on a regular basis. There are times where Lil and I think we've lost our minds. Our kids are pretty certain that we've lost our minds. But I can say to you, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't do anything different. But it required us to get out of our comfort zone, to answer quickly, and to be a little scared. So here's the last thing that happens when you pray earnestly for God to use you, and then you actually listen to what he calls you to. It's going to turn your world upside down. Those first disciples were fishermen. That's what they knew. It's what they did. And Jesus flipped their world upside down. Jesus called them to something bigger than that, something different than that. Look, it's not that what they were doing before was wrong. It was an honorable profession. It's what they were doing was too small. God had something bigger planned for their lives, something more spectacular. Jesus calls Peter to leave his nets and become a fisher of men. Peter would go on to preach a sermon on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people would follow Jesus. He would walk on water. He would write two books of the New Testament. He would become one of the most respected and trusted early church leaders. Peter didn't know any of those things when he decided to follow Jesus. He had to take a risk. We wouldn't be talking about Peter 2,000 years later if he had not gotten out of that boat and followed Jesus. Following Jesus turned his world upside down. And then Peter helped turn the world upside down. Look, I'm not suggesting that if you follow Jesus and say yes and get out of your comfort zone, you're going to get to walk on water. But what I am saying is this. You're never going to know the exciting and mission-filled life that God is calling you to unless you say yes. Even when it's scary. Even when it's sudden. Don't watch Christianity happen around you. Be a part of the mission to change the world through Jesus Christ. If you're waiting for life to get easier, all the kids to be gone, everything to sell the house to get paid for, probably never going to happen the way you want it to. There'll always be a reason, but the call is to serve now. Recently, I I got to baptize a guy who had lived a pretty rough life. I mean, he'd made some mistakes, some some big mistakes that he was not proud of. And and before he got baptized, somebody told me, uh, Stacy Wilkins actually told me, he's He's a little nervous because he's worried that what he's done is, is, is too big for Jesus. And so I got to go talk to him and I told him, it's not about what you've done. It's about what's been done for you. Whatever you've done, grace is greater than your sin. And so when I told him that, he was encouraged and he was ready to get baptized. And so I baptized him. Then I found out later that he has terminal cancer. He's already lost 70 pounds. He's getting towards the end of the six-month period that the doctors gave him. I don't know what's in store for that guy in this life, but here's what I know. He has an eternity with Jesus because people said yes to following him and began to share the good news. That's what I know. I get to play a little part in eternity. I get to play a little part in people's lives being changed. That's what I'm called to. But the reality is, you're called to that same thing. It's when you realize that you were created to serve and you say yes to that calling that your world gets turned upside down. 
Some of you may not know this, but Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a tent maker. That's what he did for a living. He made tents. But we don't talk about Paul every Sunday almost, 2,000 years later, because he made tents. We talk about him because he said yes to God. He got out of his comfort zone, and he turned the world upside down because he let Jesus turn his life upside down. Many of you go through this life, and you're, you're really disappointed and a little disillusioned because your, your life doesn't seem to have the meaning. Your, your job doesn't fulfill you the way you thought it would. It doesn't give you purpose in this life. But what if I told you that your job was never intended to give you that kind of meaning and purpose? If you're expecting that from your career, you're expecting way too much from a job. Look, you don't necessarily need to repent for a life lived wrong. What you may need to repent for is a life lived too small. You've settled for making a living when you're called to make a difference. You're called to put your hope in Jesus and to follow after him and to serve him. Your job, that's just how you pay the bills. It's not your meaning. It took me a long time to realize that. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Let Jesus turn your life upside down. I can tell you that the experience of having your life turned upside down and following after Jesus and serving him is greater than money or power or anything else you can think of because you get to play a role in life change. God has a big plan for the world. He's got a big plan for his church and you can be a part of that. He wants to turn your life upside down so that you can help turn this community upside down, this city upside down, this nation upside down. But it all starts with you praying that prayer. God, use me. And then you answer the call. Let's pray.